Second lesson comes from 1 John chapter 1, going into the second chapter, verse 2. These words will serve as the basis of this morning's sermon. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim that we have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness... We lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of our Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on this morning was that second reading we heard from 1 John chapter 1 into 1 John chapter 2. But as we begin meditation on that word, let us pray. Lord, we know that we can go anywhere, but yet you are there with us. We can't escape your presence, and we can hide nothing from you. So in that thought, Lord, reveal our hearts, show us our sins, but grant us also your forgiveness. In your name we pray. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's going to be uh, this afternoon, probably about 20 minutes after service, so we're going to have one more planning committee meeting. And our main topic for discussion today is going to be talking about, you know, basically restarting the whole remodeling process, putting out there, where do we want to do, what do we want to do, inside and outside, who's going to do it, when are we going to do it, how are we going to provide the cost for it. And not to do committee work via sermon, but what would you guys think if I threw into those plans having a confessional booth here at church? Some people laugh. Some people laugh. What do you think? A confessional booth. Put that in church. I got some affirmations and I heard enough. I'm guessing a majority of the people would not want a confessional booth. And why do, why do we, and I include myself in that statement, why do we have kind of a stigma against the confessional booth? I think a lot of us, when we think about it, we think immediately, well, that's just too darn Catholic. You know, we're Lutherans. To have something that's so, so associated with the Roman Catholic Church in a Lutheran church, it's like a violation of who we are. Like a confessional booth, in case you don't know what it is, it is just this little room. It's got a chair in each, separated by a screen. People go in, pastor, priest, and the other, and they confess their sins. The screen is for the purpose of not knowing who the person is, and you lay it all out there. I guess the feeling that we might get is because we've seen the abuses of the confessional booth. It's only been around for about 500 years or so, started in the 16th century in Milan, as they say the first one was built, and then the Roman Catholic Church adopted it into every church building from there. But we know kind of what goes on in those confessional booths. People come in, they confess their sins to a pastor or a priest, and then the priest, particularly from the Roman Catholic Church, are going to say, now, here's what you have to do to be forgiven. And they'll say, you have to do so many of these prayers, so many of these prayers, do these things, and then you'll have forgiveness. And of course, for us, when we hear that it is by grace we've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast, even by prayers, the whole idea of a confessional booth is just, just wrong, then. 
If you're going to use it to tell me how I can earn forgiveness, I don't want it. I don't want it in my church. There might be another reason why we wouldn't want to have a confessional booth. Probably some of you are just simply thinking about going through that process. To come to the pastor, to come to the priest and confess my sins. And probably your thought is, you don't need to know. I don't want you to know. And then maybe an unspoken <laughs> variety of that is, and I'm pretty sure you'll think less of me if you did know. If I laid myself out there, if I put out all of the sins that I have actually done, all the ones that I know, the ones that trouble me and grieve me, and my pastor knows it, I mean, maybe he might tell someone, maybe he might violate that trust, and then all of a sudden my sins have become public. Quite frankly, I think it's a better solution to just hide the sins. And even if I did have to go to a confessional booth, I'll just tell him the ones that are more commonplace, the ones that he probably hears all the time, so that again, I don't have to feel like I'm such a bad sinner. Let's hide it. And really, isn't that the first solution that mankind ever came up with in regards to sin? Let's hide it. In the Garden of Eden, when God had commanded them not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and yet they did, God comes out, he calls to them, they're hiding. When they finally come out and they ask, God says to Adam, did you eat from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Uh, she did it. And then to Eve, what is this you've done? The devil made me do it. Let's not confess our sins, let's hide them. Let's pretend like it didn't really happen to us. It wasn't really our thinking. Let's just hide it and hope it goes away. You know, I almost think that if I were, now just so you know, I'm not going to, not going to propose that we put a confessional booth during our planning committee. But, I'm pretty sure if I did it, some people would just kind of not look at me and want to just kind of go away because we don't want to confess our sins. I'm not going to propose building a confessional booth today, but what I am proposing to you is to confess our sins. It's not an invention of the 16th century. It's something that Christians have been doing for a very long time. Something that we have examples of throughout Scripture. That you can go backwards and you can go to the Psalms. And when you read through the Psalms, there you hear very clear confessions of sin. David pouring his heart out, talking about how wretched a sinner he is. You have the fact that the priests of the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices every single day of the week. One in the morning, one in the evening, and that's in addition to all the other special ones that they did. And every time they were doing it, they were doing it for the sin. They were confessing their sins and the sins of the people. Confession of sins is not a new thing. But it is something we try to hide from in any age, in any generation. What John wants us to hear in writing his letter, first he wants to tell us, if we try to hide our sins... This is going to be bad. This is not going to go well for us. And you hear it. He says it in three different ways. He says, first, if we claim to have fellowship with God, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. He said earlier, God is light. What does light do to darkness? It dispels it. It gets rid of it. What God is saying is, because I'm light, if you want to live with me, if you want to walk with me, you are going to be completely exposed. Light will shine on you. You can't hide anything from me. I know it all. If you like to not acknowledge that, if you like to say, no, God doesn't show me my sin. If I look at his law and yet I say, you know what? No, I, I don't want to examine it. I don't want to see how I've fallen short. That's what he says, you're walking in darkness. As we say, we lie. Because we're saying we walk with God. 
but yet his word shines no light into our lives. Our sin remain in darkness, and we think this is for the best. If I just kind of ignore it, keep it covered up, I can just go about my life, and everything's fine. But that's a lonely place living in darkness. John says, if anyone, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So even more than just lying in general, now we're deceiving ourselves. If we look at God's law and we don't confess our sins, if we, if we see what we have and just say, no, I don't need to talk about this. I don't need to feel bad about who I am or what I've done. I don't need to feel all guilty and judged. By doing so, we remain in darkness and we give up that fellowship that we have with God because we don't want to feel guilty and judged. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Not only if we say that we have no sin, we lie to ourselves, but in fact, we make God out to be a liar. Because he said, surely you're sinful from birth, sinful from the time you've been conceived. You are a sinner. When you look at my law and you see the righteousness that I require, the perfection that I demand of you, you're not there. And if you want to say, no, it's not that bad. No, I, I don't really have those kind of sins on my conscience. Then we are actually trying to lay claim to being God. That we are perfect and I have nothing wrong with me or nothing wrong in my life, and I need no forgiveness. But to do so takes God's word and completely throws it out the window, saying, no, I'm not going to use that in my life. And that way we remain in darkness, trying to hide our unconfessed sins, and not having any fellowship with God. The light is gone. So instead of trying to hide these sins, what our sinful nature wants to do, let's cover it up, let's not show anybody that this is what's going on. Instead of doing that, John tells us what the solution is. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. God is light. And no, it's not pleasant to be completely exposed and vulnerable. But if we are truly walking with God, if we are going to claim any fellowship with Him, He's going to show us what we are. And we are sinners. We have sins that we try to hide, but He reveals it all. He says the solution is to let the light reveal it. Come clean before God. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we admit our sins, when we confess, yes, Lord, I am, I am broken, I have been disobedient, I have been wicked, I continue to sin day after day, and I even want to stop, but I know I don't. When we confess our sins, he says, I am faithful and just. I forgive it all. That my blood purifies you from every sin, every wrinkle, every blemish, every stain, everything that we thought we could never get rid of and only darkness could hide. Jesus says, my blood covers over it. I'm the atoning sacrifice. I make you at one with God because I gave up my life for you. And not just for you, but for the whole entire world. I've paid for all of their sins. That's what he offers to us as we come to the light and are completely exposed. And when we sin, we have something even greater. If anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. The righteous one. Every time that we sin, every time that we don't think we're good enough to be before God, every time we want to try to hide, but we have Jesus there to show his Father once again, see where the nail marks are. 
See where my side has been pierced. Yeah, they've broken the law. I've paid for it. Your justice is satisfied. My blood covers over their sins. They're forgiven because I've paid the price. There's no use in trying to hide our sins. We might think we can get away with that. It kind of works for us. But God knows. Trying to hide them will only hurt us. So instead, we come before God and we confess those sins to Him. Okay, I get it. You don't want a confessional booth. But we have this most wonderful gift from God that we can make use of every single day. Big terms, we say it's confession and absolution. It's saying what our sins are, confessing them, and it's giving an absolution. It's forgiving them, letting them know that God has forgiven us. I said that to the kids here. But we need to model it as adults. You know, that is what we teach our kids, right? When somebody wrongs you, you say you're sorry. And then what do you say back? It's okay. It's not. It's really not okay when someone sins against you. It's not okay to do wrong. So instead of saying, it's okay, that's the difference we can make. When someone says, I'm sorry, you can say, God forgives you. I forgive you. You can tell them about the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb, of Jesus Christ, that His blood purifies us from all unrighteousness. He forgives us because He has forgiven me for all the things I've done wrong. I forgive you in the same way. And when we do this, when we go about this, and we forgive each other in this way, we can know it's just as valid between you and me as it is between us and our Father in Heaven. Our sins have been forgiven. This is what He's done for us. This is what the risen Christ has done for us. So I know our sins are scary, and I know we want to hide them. But when we come to God, when we claim to have fellowship with Him, He exposes those. And at the same time that our sins are exposed and we are completely before Him without excuse, He says, well, look at my son. He has died for you. He's forgiven you. This is my confession. I am a sinner. But the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies me from every sin. I'm forgiven because of him. And so are you. Amen.